Welcome today. We're going to bring you another great message for our healing service today. Now you should always be telling your unsafe friends to tune if tune in if they can. This is so important. One word from God can totally revolutionize their lives. And that's the truth. I'm sure many of us know that for sure. We suddenly heard a word from God, touched our spirit, we responded, and I believe these messages are created by God, it's His Word, and it can totally revolutionize your life. That's what we're believing for today. So Father, we thank You that Your Word is going to be life and spirit to everybody listening today, and even miracles can take place as they're listening to Your Word. That's what we believe. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the message today is called Setting the Captives Free. Now, multitudes of people in this world today are held hostage by the devil in their minds and emotions. Although they belong to Jesus and legally they have the right to freedom, they remain in spiritual bondage in certain, certain areas of their lives. You see, the mind is the primary area that Satan always seeks to attack. He knows that once he succeeds in planting a stronghold of deception in some area of a person's mind, he can then begin to control and manipulate that person. Now, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, this was Paul speaking, he said, the Bible calls this kind of deception in the mind a stronghold. It is a stronghold because once a lie is planted in someone's head, it is very hard to remove. Understand? Very hard to remove. But 1 John 3, 8 says that Jesus came into this world that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested then that he would destroy Satan's hold on them. Now, until the devil's works in people's lives are utterly destroyed, that's what it means. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus' redemptive work destroyed the power of the enemy. And our liberty was fully purchased. You see, setting people free from Satan's power has always been Jesus' primary concern. We read in 1 John 3, 8 that this was the purpose that the Son of God was manifested on this earth. All right? Therefore, it is time for you to learn how to recognize the devil's strategies. Jesus came to set people free, and God wants the works of the devil destroyed in people's lives. Now, the mind may be the devil's preferred battlefield, but you can make sure he loses every battle. That's possible. Now, many people are haunted by their past, and they find it very difficult, for whatever reason, to start moving forward. Some fear that their shortcomings will one day catch up to them. Others refuse to let go of the hurts and the disappointments they've experienced over the years. Let's face it, we have all done or experienced things that we were not proud of. But if you allow what has happened in the past to keep you bound, you will remain trapped in the past, and consequently, that mental entrapment will be responsible for all your failures in life. Okay? Now, as Christians, the key to our freedom from the past is to do what the Word of God encourages. I'm going to read a scripture from Isaiah chapter 43 now, verse 18, and it says this, Remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Now in the very next verse, the Lord says, Behold, I will do a new thing. I wonder how many people are holding on to the past, their fears, their insecurities, their offenses, thereby hindering God from doing new things in their lives. Rather than letting go of the shackles 
they keep them on and subconscious, subconsciously they're finding comfort in them. They become used to the hurt and the pain. They've accepted the lie that they are simply part of life. But let's not blame the devil for the th things which we ourselves are responsible. Now, the devil loves it when Christians hold on to their past. He will use whatever he can to build a case against you, to condemn you, convincing you that you're not worthy to succeed in life, at least not in the things of God. For example, Satan will use the memory of a partner's affair to continually drive a wedge between a husband and wife, and that's driving them towards divorce. See, the devil will provoke someone's anger towards a parent who it seems has abandoned them through a divorce. He'll use guilt, shame, to emotionally condemn a young woman who's had an abortion. Now, the bottom line is that the Bible refers to Satan as our great accuser who continually points out the sh our shortcomings to the Lord. See? Revelations chapter 12, verse 10 tells us, And I heard a great voice in heaven. Now has come salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of the brothers is cast down, who accused them before our God day and night. See, allowing to condemn you, and he has you right where he wants you, chained to your past and under his control. But there's liberty in Christ. If you or someone you know is in bondage to the past, the first step to freedom and wholeness is to make a quality decision to live free. My friends, God wants you set free. You must learn to renew your mind to the fact that it's up to you to break free from whatever has bound you in the mental, emotional, social, financial, and physical realms. Decide right now that you will change the way you think so you can change the way that you live. If you're convinced that you deserve to experience hard times because of your past decisions, then that's exactly, I guarantee you, what you will experience. Now, according to Proverbs 23, verse 7, you are who you think you are. Will you remember that? You are who you think you are. I cannot stress that enough. The way you think is the key to living free. Now, everything in our fallen world naturally goes from good to bad. Things don't get better without effort. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, We have to seek to find, knock to get the door open, and ask before we receive. We must raise our sights, aim higher, most people are shooting at nothing and eating it every time. Okay? Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says this, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now the New International Version says it, his thoughts this way, will give you hope, and a future. See, when the Lord inspired Jeremiah to write these words, Israel at that point was devastated. The city of Jerusalem had been destroyed, and many people had been taken captive to Babylon. Thoughts of peace were probably the last thing on their minds. But Jeremiah, Jeremiah went on to say in verses 12 to 13, Then you will call upon me, and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me, listen to this, with all your heart. Now the key is, you have to seek with all your heart. That's a missing element. You have to reach a point where you want to live with, 
with anything less than God's best. Now, this attitude is missing in the lives of far too many Christians today. The bar of expectation has been lowered in regards to healing, finances, and so much more. Now, I'm not trying to condemn anyone. Nobody learns how to receive God's best overnight. It's a process. But we need to begin moving in that direction. Christians should be walking in victory. Supernatural healing, soundness, spirit, soul, and body, as well as financial prosperity. Okay? But you will never receive God's best until you become completely dissatisfied with second best. Dissatisfied with mediocrity. Now, one of these days, we will all stand before God. And when we do, in an instant, we're going to know what we could have had while on this earth. Ephesians 1, verse 18 to 20, tell us, we will understand that the same power that raised Christ from the dead was present within us all along. Now listen, unless you're willing to stand and fight the fight of faith, and it is a fight, you will be overcome by this world. If you do not stir yourself up, you will settle to the bottom. The world isn't going to encourage you towards God's best, and most Christians aren't either. We all know that we should think on good things that are positive and uplifting. Now the question is, how can I habitually think good thoughts? I've confessed the Word, prayed, I've read my Bible, but I'm still overcome by discouraging and depressing thoughts. I still feel like a failure. Well, if that is the way you feel, you're having your future stolen by the devil. In the 10th chapter of John, Jesus said, the thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That is John 10, 10. I say it many times. Now we know that the thief to whom he is referring to, is definitely Satan. Since Satan is a thief by nature, he steals. That's the nature of a thief, isn't it? Hmm? Jesus says that Satan is a thief. So it shouldn't be surprising to us that he is after something. Well, Mark 4.15 tells us, the Bible says he's after the word in your heart. He's after your joy, your power, your peace of mind, your courage, your faith, your future, and your comfort. Now, one way Satan discourages many of God's people is through affliction and persecution. If that doesn't work, he attacks their material and physical possessions. He will attack their finances, their physical bodies, or their minds. Now, many people are struggling with healing because they see healing as something that has to be attained, something out there, something which they're trying to get. But in reality, healing, listen to me now, it's not out there, somewhere. As far as God is concerned, we already have healing. It was given to us through the work of the cross. Divine health is something we already possess. When symptoms come, it's the thief trying to steal the health which is already ours. In other words, divine health is not something we're trying to get from God. It's something that the devil is trying to take away from us. Start thinking that way. Now, as long as people are trying to get health, they can't see themselves with it until they see themselves with it. They won't experience it. When the devil tries to put a symptom of sickness, of disease on my body, I'm telling you, I refuse to receive it. That's how you have to be. I rebuke the ailment. I begin to confess God's word, that I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. 
I'm not trying to get something I don't have. I'm fighting to keep something I already have. I am healed. And so are you if you're born again. Now let me give you some examples. If the bank made a mistake and they took $1,000 out of your bank account, it's still yours. It belongs to you. You would demand and you would fight to get it back, wouldn't you? So it is with healing. I am healed. And when symptoms come, you tell the devil, in the name of Jesus Christ, I am healed. The devil is not going to steal my health. Now, we all know that we should think on good things that are positive and uplifting. Now, the question is, how can I habitually think good thoughts? Well, Philippians 4, verse 8 says this, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, as any gardener knows, you must re remove the weeds and prepare the ground before you grow a good crop. Now, if we're going to have success in our thought life, we must first get rid of the weeds. Negative thought patterns. The first step in getting rid of weeds is to be able to identify and recognize what the weeds are. Now, I am convinced that all of us have self-defeating thought patterns that we don't recognize. Consequently, they continue to grow. Okay? Now, when you make a mistake, do you think, oh, I am stupid. I never do anything right. Now, these thoughts may not seem significant, but they develop into patterns of habit of thinking. All right? Habits of thinking. Now, what you think, you eventually believe. What you believe, you will feel. And what you feel, you will speak. Your feelings are a direct result of what you think. Now, if you feel discouraged or depressed, then you have been thinking and meditating on discouraging and depressing thoughts. How do you stop that process? Well, learn to recognize those negative thought patterns. Now, let's look at the statement or thought. Well, I never do anything right. Now, first of all, is that true? Of course not. You may do some things wrong, but you also do some right things. All right? That doesn't make you a failure. It makes you human. The devil would love for you to think that you're a failure because you make mistakes. Now, if that's true, all people are failures because all people make mistakes. Would Jesus stand in front of you and say, you never do anything right? No. So when that thought comes, analyze the thought in the light of the truth of God's word and then defeat that lie by speaking the truth. I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to me, because I'm in Christ Jesus. I am his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. See, you plant a good garden when you root out the weeds. Now, sometimes people say something hurtful, and I would say, Oh, I was only joking. No, they weren't. They were being mean with their words. And then they were trying to cover it up by saying it was a joke. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, in the NIV version says, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Psalm 141, verse 3, says this, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, Keep the door of my lips. We need to watch what comes out of our mouth. Our words should lift up others, not tear them down. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, 
but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. That's Ephesians 4, 29. Now, people may have ridiculed you. They may have spoken all sorts of negative things over your life. They became the prophets of your life, and you believed every word they said. Now, the entire second chapter of 2 Peter deals with these kinds of people. It refers to them as false prophets and teachers. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 says, While they, false prophets, promised them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. Now, my advice to you is that you forget what others have spoken against you or said about you. What you speak over your life is more important. You are the prophet of your own life. Remember that? You are the prophet of your own life. Keep in mind that the people will prophesy out of their souls. That's out of their thinking. The place where their minds, wills, and emotions lie thinking that they're doing you a favor. Do not live your life based on what others say about you. Our response reveals our insecurities. Often, our responses reflect our deep-seated insecurities. In some instances, these insecurities result in a response that's a little over the top. All right? Our insecurities cause us to retaliate so we get the other person to think twice about hurting us again. At other times, we don't respond at all, fearing that if we do, we're likely to incur further attacks or more abuse. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could open the top of our head like a lid, reach inside into our brain and clear out all the traumatic memories? The next step would be to put the lid back on, go on our way with a mind cleared of painful and hurtful associations with our past. It can be done, but there's a way to do it scripturally. Philippians 3.13 says this, Forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Now, this verse tells us that we can turn 180 degrees from looking into our past and can begin to confidently peer into the future. When you are chained to the past with all the hurts, the regrets, offenses that you dwell on, it's the same as having your back to the future. Now, let me say that again. When you are chained to the past, with all the hurts, all the regrets, all the offenses that you dwell on. It's the same as having your back to the future. That's called bondage. You're going in the wrong direction. Let's get things in order by pulling the weeds out instead of mixing bad seed with good seed. You can become aware of these twisted thought patterns by recognizing your feelings. Most of your negative feelings come from negative thoughts. If you feel down and out, stop and examine what you've been thinking about. You'll find out where those feelings come from. You can harness those negative thoughts and change your feelings, and that will change the course of your life. You say, how? By speaking God's Word and changing the direction of your thoughts, are taking you. What you think upon will defeat you or make you victorious. Now, let me encourage you that there is indeed hope no matter what you may be facing. Well, the question is why? Because our hope is anchored in an omnipotent God, even as Revelation 19, 16 proclaims to us. It says this, And I heard as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of a mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Amen? There is no greater power. No situation 
He's beyond his ability and authority. Whatever you're facing, whatever fear you might have, remember our Lord reigns and he is omnipotent. Friends, there is no situation so desperate. There is no person too hopeless. No circumstance so dire that he cannot intervene and turn things around. Complete freedom from the past is available to you through Jesus Christ. Galatians 5.1 says this, Stand fast, therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now what does it mean to be free in Christ? Well, God allowed Jesus to come to the earth to sacrifice his life so that you and I could experience complete freedom. The Bible says that Jesus is the Christ. Christ is not his last name. It speaks of who he is. Christ means the anointed one. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus stood in the temple in Jerusalem and he read a verse in Isaiah chapter 61. This verse prophesied about the coming Messiah whom the Jews were expecting to liberate them. And he specifically read the first verse of Isaiah 61, verse 1. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisons to those who are bound. Now, after Jesus read that, he made a statement that shocked and horrified the religious leaders of his day. He said in Luke 4.21, then he began to speak to them, the scripture that you have just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Now, in simple terms, I am, you are, if you're born again, the fulfillment of the scripture. Jesus let everyone know that he was the one anointed to bring liberty to all of mankind. Now, according to Isaiah 10, verse 27, the anointing has burden, removing, yoke, destroying effects. And it shall be in the last day His burden shall be taken away from off your shoulder and his yoke from off your neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Now a burden of yoke is anything that is designed to keep you from experiencing the goodness of God in your life. For example, poverty is a burden. Sin is a burden. Sickness is a burden. And let's not forget that the negative aspects of your life are burdens and yokes designed to destroy you. But knowing that you have a right to live free in Jesus is not enough. Galatians 5.13 says, You must make a quality decision to never again allow your past to enslave you. Many of you listening to me right now are allowing things of the past to enslave you. Don't do that. Now, to fully understand your freedom in Jesus, listen what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You are a new creation if you're in Christ. That means anyone who belongs to Christ has become like a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. Praise God. Now, in other words, through Jesus, the old you has been replaced by the new, and guess what? Improved you. You are a born-again believer who has every right to experience now the goodness of God in everything every area of your life. It doesn't matter what you did in the past. It doesn't matter what mistakes you may have made since becoming born again, and some of we all have, but God is concerned with your decision to live in him now, which is in accordance with his will. 
In him you can have, you can live free outside of him. You can forget it. You're doomed to fail if you do. Galatians 5.13 says, For brothers, you were called to liberty. Only do not use the liberty for an opening to the flesh. But by love, serve one another. See, start by studying and applying the word of God to your life. You know what the problem with Christianity today is? Not enough people are studying the Word of God. Don't leave that just to pastors and teachers. You should be studying the Word of God for yourself. James referred to the Word as the perfect law of liberty. God wants you to find that. Live by God's perfect Word so that you can perfect your relationship with Him and enjoy your freedom. God sees you as his child. Listen to 1 Peter 2, verse 9. For you are a chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he's called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. See, as far as God is concerned, you are special. Never forget, that you can do what the Word says you can do. You can have what it says you can have. And you are what it says you are. That settles it. My last word to you is, live free. Christ came and he set you free. Set you free indeed. It's the Word that will inspire you and lift you up into that freedom. May the Lord bless you. Listen to this Word over and over. Share it with someone else. God bless you. Now, I have some prayer requests that come in, and and, and God bless you. They're coming more and more all the time. Now, I'm going to pray for them right now. Would you agree with me? You know, when two agree together, the Lord says, that puts a thousand to flight. Could you imagine all you listening today and passing this on to others, what it will do? It's going to start setting people free, some of your loved ones, friends that don't know the Lord properly. Let's believe God for miracles for them, which will turn their hearts to him. You see, salvation is what God's interested in right now. Father, you see all the people represented on the prayer requests. We ask in the name of Jesus, where we're in agreement right now, that you by your Spirit will move into every circumstance, and whatever the circumstances are, set them free in the name of Jesus. Heal them, restore them, bless them in every way. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Now, Father, for the people who've been listening today, I pray if there's any out there and you've never allowed the Lord Jesus to come into your life. Now, if you've listened all the way through, I believe God has been touching you. Absolutely. Opening your mind to a new destination. And that destination is to put things right with God. You can right now. You see, people say, oh, you know, I, 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 no excuses. Listen to me. If this is not real, then it doesn't matter, does it? But if it is real and something great happens to you, look what you're missing out on. I'm going to pray for you. And I want you just to close your eyes and say these words with me. If you're not a born-again Christian. A born-again means born back into the family of God. It's not a new religion. This is how it started in Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago. The gospel doesn't change. It's religion that has changed and put people in bondage. Let's break out of bondage and come into freedom. Say this prayer with me right now. Father, I realize that I have a sinful nature. I was born with it. We inherited it. But Father, you said Jesus came. He died on that cross. And because his blood was spilled, his life was given over for us. He has forgiven us. He's redeemed us if we will just confess him as Lord and Savior. Father, I confess I am a sinner right now. And I ask Jesus to come into my life, my heart, my spirit, and make me born again. Thank you, Jesus. I receive your forgiveness. Father, that makes me a child of God. Help me, lead me to a good church, to people of like mind that will help me and encourage me. Father, 
help me to get possess a Bible and begin to read your gospel, especially from John chapter 1, John's gospel. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. We would love to hear from you. Wherever you are in our nation or overseas, you know, if we can help and direct you to a church, we would do that. God bless you. And I'm going to pray for all those who may be sick. Father, in the name of Jesus, I take authority in Jesus' name. And the reason I do this, Father, is you said, because of our communication today in television that Jesus never had, we'd be able to do some things that he couldn't do. And I can speak to hundreds and thousands of people by your word and communication by these broadcasts. I speak to you in the name of Jesus. Whatever your problem is, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, be it blindness, deafness, problems in your organs, arthritic conditions, lameness, pancreas problems, lungs, heart, liver, kidneys, bones, I loosen you to be healed in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, by the power of your Spirit, touch them right now. Lord, you have no limitations, so we speak your word. You're the healer, Jesus, and we thank you by the stripes of Jesus. When the Romans whipped him, Father, you put sickness and disease upon him. You broke the curse over our life. You never intended your creation to live in sickness and disease. Father, we believe and we receive. And I believe from this moment, maybe miracles have taken place, instant healing. But Father, most people generally begin to recover. Help them to thank you in Jesus' name till they see their total recovery and to bind their mouths by only speaking positive things. Speak the answer, not the problem. You know the problem. Don't talk about the problem. Talk about the health that comes to you in the name of Jesus. God bless you. Thank you for looking in today and thank you for your wonderful support so we can take this to other countries. That's our intention. In Jesus' name, amen.